Good morning to all across Canada and a warm good afternoon to those of you in the African continent today. Welcome to the Canada Africa Chamber of Business webinar on water amidst COVID-19, how we use innovative technologies to address some of the challenges. We've got two expert panelists with us today who I'm going to introduce to in a moment. And we're also joined by dozens of you uh, from across the various consular corps in the capital, Ottawa, as well as on the ground on the African continent. I'd like to give some special recognition to heads of mission. Those are the ambassadors and the high commissioners joining us from Tanzania, as well as those um, representing Sudan. Uh, and then I believe we also have Kenya on the call as well, in addition to representatives from South Africa, among other countries. I know as many people are logging in and joining, a number of you have indicated that you may need to leave uh, a little early. The recording will be available to everybody who requires it. And we're certainly very keen to have follow-up engagement as always. You'll have around 30 minutes today to engage directly with our two expert speakers. And from there, you'll have the ability to get in touch. A warm welcome to those of you from academia, particularly those from academia at the various universities in Canada. Your interest in the continent and seeing the new innovations that have emerged uh, are well appreciated and thank you too for sharing these with your students and incorporating some of what you see today into your research. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank Brian Dodo in particular. He's going to be introduced in his capacity as a speaker, but the Canada Africa Chamber of Business would not exist for the past 27 years, welcoming heads of state, leading delegations and engaging on Canada Africa affairs if it wasn't for Brian and his leadership serving on the board of directors. So Brian Dodo, thank you very much. You're not only a board member, but also a patron and a great supporter of this organization for well over a decade. It's appreciated. Uh, I'm going to now proceed for the formal introductions. And uh, we have two incredible speakers with us who are well respected in the field. Uh, kicking off is Brian Dodo himself. He's CEO of Map Africa, and he'll be sharing how countries and organizations are leveraging technology to manage and monitor water during this particular pandemic. Of course, there's been an increased need for higher priority testing that's put unprecedented strain on lab infrastructure across the globe. While we're focused on Africa solutions today, you'll see that this technology has been applied worldwide and he'll be going into a variety of areas in its application. Brian is the principal of BM Dodo Strategic Design. It's an award-winning strategic design firm based right here in Canada. He's originally from Zimbabwe, neighboring country to my own South Africa. And this platform, Map Africa Inc., is focused on helping Africa build its capacity and its resilience. They have an exclusive Africa-wide distribution license for Tecta PDS, a fully automated microbiology system, which you'll be hearing about today. It performs on-site on regulatory compliance testing uh, and certainly is at the cutting edge. Douglas Walton uh, has 20 years of experience and that's all in the senior operational and general management level. He's got multiple successes in the development and the management of new technical businesses across a host of environments. He assumed the role of president and CEO after leading the management buyout of Tech to PDS uh, and 2016. Sales are currently in over 40 countries and he guides the organization in its pursuit of revolutionizing the microbiological monitoring of water. Douglas, your um, creation of a multi-million dollar business facility has provided inventory management, logistics, manufacturing services, and uh, your commitment to expansion and on the ground work across the African continent is certainly well respected. I'd also like to acknowledge we've just been joined by MP Ratanzi, Member of Parliament. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and of course, all others will be joining us through the program. If I may now hand over to Mr. Brian Dodo, floor is yours and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Garrett, and thank you everyone for joining us. I'm going to just share my screen, um, if you don't mind, Garrett. Thank you. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for joining us, and uh, thanks, Doug, for um, co-presenting this uh, with me today. And uh, so what uh, we wanted to try and uh, do is just take you through some of the challenges that we've been hearing from our clients on the ground, uh, whether in Africa or elsewhere. Uh, and we wanted to also give you a sense of how technology is being leveraged by a lot of the entities to at least um, manage some of the situations that we're all going through right now uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, so I, I have a few slides to share. I'll skip through some of these slides uh, quickly because um, uh, Gareth has already touched a little bit on that. 
Um, I won't be going through the slides point by point. I'm just going to talk through, but I'll, I'll switch and put some information up so that you can sort of take some information in if, uh, if you need. Uh, so like we said, uh, the issue of uh, lab capacity has, has been limited around the globe due to COVID. Uh, obviously, all the labs are the ones that are required to run the um, COVID tests and so forth. Uh, and due to that, there's been um, a bit of a strain on all the other services that labs generally do. So that includes uh, running the water testing, uh, which is obviously affected by that. Uh, and also the other challenge that uh, has been going on is that there's a huge, uh, well, there's a low staffing level right now due to that. So some of our clients on the ground have been telling us a lab that may have 20 people is now having to work with uh, four people to enable social distancing uh, while the rest are working remotely. And the current lab setup doesn't allow uh, for the lab to run with such a limited staff. And that's sort of one of the challenges that we've been noticing. There's also the challenge of, um, and we're seeing it here in Canada as well, the challenge of uh, just transporting uh, material from one location to another. So when you have the lockdown issues and the lockdown requirements, when one person is coming from a region that might not might, might be low in the COVID numbers and moving to a region where it might be high, those are presenting some challenges. So transportation, the cost of transport and so forth are all challenges that unfortunately a lot of, a lot of our clients are having to contend with. Um, then you have the idea that uh, most of it still require that someone carry all this information to a lab, the lab runs it, the process of running it, uh, records sometimes are kept manually. So on paper and so forth, they're not digitally stored and all of those present uh, some challenges. Um, the other challenges we've been uh, finding is that the limited uh, test of uh, E. coli and fecal coliforms and ensuring that everything is uh, properly disinfected. Uh, challenges that in my view present even a greater challenge than uh, COVID itself in that issues like cholera, which we see come up on the African continent quite a bit, uh, or typhoid, those rise when uh, things are not monitored properly. So that presents uh, a huge challenge. And when the labs are not able to actually ensure things are going well, uh, that creates uh, um, a challenge. And so what we've been, uh, what we're trying to do is in this particular call, we want to try and answer uh, a few questions. And one of them is how do we get to leverage technology and ensure that using technology, we can keep people apart, so social distance. Uh, and how do we make technology uh, used in such a way that it can increase the actual ability of those limited teams to be able to run more tests um, and so forth. So that's one of the challenges. And then obviously there's the second question, well, the third question rather of how do we then take what they've already been doing and try to increase the capacity uh, within those plants uh, that are running. So with some of the technologies that are out there, uh, instead of having 20 people run it, you can have one person uh, run 20 tests. So it, it just makes it uh, a lot easier to do. And so the other challenge that uh, a lot of technology companies have been finding is that how do you then get the technology to present results that are lab equivalent? So some of them are almost um, so tests that are being done as in an intermediate solution as opposed to a full solution just because of the challenges that uh, it presents. So from this point on, I think I'm just going to ask Doug to jump in as we go through the rest of the slides. All right, thanks so much, Brian. Really appreciate the, uh, the introduction and, and thanks to you and, uh, and Gareth also for this, uh, for this great invitation to be uh, speaking on this topic in, in front of this incredible audience. So those four challenges that, uh, that Brian mentioned on that previous slide, that's really the, the crux of the matter that we've got right now is uh, how can we use automation to be really expanding the capacity of the lab? How can we use it to extend the capacity actually beyond the four walls? And how can we make them more efficient and cost savings? What I'm gonna do over this next slide or two is I'm gonna compare and contrast uh, standard microbiological testing with a fully automated method. 
for those that don't really appreciate microbiological testing, and I can really understand why you might not, because it's a it's a topic that's of interest to microbiologists, but the, the rest of us just, uh, you know, it, it just, we, we assume that uh, things are continuing on. Microbiology really has not changed, particularly for testing for things like E. coli in the last 40 or 50 years. And that's basically a shocking statement, but it's correct. It's an entirely a manual process. These cartridge, these bottles are, are collected from these sample sites. They have to be manipulated there's various things that have to be added to the ingredients. They then get put away into a, a, an oven, basically, and they get incubated for up to 48 hours. They then come out, they get entirely manual interpretation. There's a manual record keeping process. And it really is understandable why a well-run, efficient lab that can take up to 48 hours or perhaps even 72 hours to generate those results. Imagine if you've got samples that are being transported over a distance and it really can take a week up to get those results. And compare this, of course, to the fact that now you've got this inundation of all these additional tests that you have to be running and you've got fewer staff and all those challenges of this COVID pandemic, all of a sudden you've got a bit of a perfect storm that's come together and your lab is really under a great deal of pressure to perform. So that's traditional microbiology. Moving on, let's compare that and contrast that with a fully automated method, if we could, Brian. Oh, I apologize. There's one more example here. I forgot about this slide. This is showing the visual interpretation here. And this is the challenge that the lab has of trying to determine a positive result. A positive result here is just showing by the fluorescence that's glowing in these, uh, in these cartridges here. And you can tell that even though there's only one negative sample, you've got a massive range of cartridges that are glowing a great deal versus those cartridges that aren't glowing at all. And these are the challenges of these uh, manual interpretive methods. So even at the best of times, these methods can be a challenge. So if we compare that to a fully automated method, the, the tech, the system is, we, we often refer to it as a lab in a box. It's an incredible ease of use. We have some customers around the world that they describe it as a set and forget technology because it allows you to take the sample, place it into the cartridge, as you see in step number one, place that into the unit, and really at that point, you are walking away. It is a system that is US EPA approved and you get rapid results much more quickly than traditional methods that I was just describing. Brian mentioned the challenges of uh, manual record keeping. It's not just that you wanna have automation through the, the interpretation of the results. You need to have automation that can take the entire process from when that sample is received all the way through to the end result. So the ability to have secure storage of your reports, the ability to make the entire system networkable, the ability to automate the reporting process, and then integrate that with your laboratory information management system. Those are the key things that really are the final steps uh, in the automation process. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what really are the advantages that we can talk about? What opportunities exist if you've got a fully automated, rapid, easy to use microbiological system? All of a sudden, we're not just talking about using it for drinking water compliance samples, but it can be used for the entire water cycle. You can be using it for drinking water, of course, those treatment steps, broken replacement pipes, all of a sudden you can be applying this to your source in your recreational water. Sewage overflows are a tremendous challenge across the world. Monitoring those sewage overflows and taking appropriate action is incredibly important. Uh, waste and reuse water, confirming the treatment steps, the final effluent, and even uh, the use of sludge, you need to confirm that those biosolids that are being released or being spread into the environment are safe before they're doing so. You have incredible advantages if you've got a fully automated system. Just a quick picture here of the various tests that are available to cover all of those uh, different applications that we are talking about, be it E. coli, be it fecal coliform, be it enterococcus, being applied in both natural waters, being applied in, in marine waters as well. <clears throat> Let's consider some use cases. And really, these are the areas that uh, I really get excited about talking because it's, it's the areas that the customers are, are actually using uh, automated technology in order to improve their situation. Use case number one is when you're taking the automated system automated microbiology and you're improving the, uh, bringing the benefits of that automation into a large lab environment. The first example we have here is PUV Singapore. Their goal was to fully automate the drinking water testing. They wanted to reduce their time specifically for their emergency samples, and they wanted to reduce the overall manpower to interpret the results. And they've been very successful using the TECTA system to accomplish those goals. Other folks that uh, we'd like to talk about is the Kuwait Ministry of Health. The Kuwait Ministry of Health has switched to the automated TECTA system 
for all of their water types from around the country. They've reduced the burden on their lab technicians and they are producing more rapid results. So these two examples are large lab operations that have introduced an automated microbiological system uh, like TECTA and they've massively reduced the burden on the labs and they've, extended, they've expanded the capacity of the lab for testing. Use case number two is a good example here is Las Vegas. What they've done is they've extended the capacity outside the four walls of their lab operation. And what they did here is they've actually set up a satellite lab that is downtown Las Vegas. It's about 100 kilometers removed from their, from their large lab operation that's uh, co-located in the water treatment plant. And their goal was they wanted fully automated testing for all of their water main breaks, their installations, and their repairs that were taking place. They also utilize this automated system for uh, all of their weekend samples. It's a bit of a, uh, a running joke in the water industry that we have a good idea of what the water quality is from Monday to uh, Thursday afternoons, but samples that are taken Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they don't get tested until the Monday. They wanted to solve this issue by creating this satellite lab. It gave them more flexibility, more rapid results. And because the system was networkable, all of the data network flows back to the main lab. So this is how they've extended the capacity of their lab to 100 kilometers away. Next example is uh, water care in New Zealand. Rather than creating a satellite lab, what they did is they located the Tectus solutions inside their water treatment lab in the water treatment plant itself. So their goal too was to extend the capacity of the lab and they extended it from the lab right into the treatment plant itself. They automated their on-site testing in their drinking water plants. It gave them more flexibility, more rapid results. And I think this is a theme, it reduced the burden overall on the lab. Moving along, um, the third use case that we often talk about is really automation on site in place of the lab. So you cannot just extend the capacity of a lab to, uh, to, a, to 100 kilometers away. You could potentially extend the capacity to thousands of kilometers away or replace the lab entirely. And this is what we've done in sites in Australia and Mauritania. They wanted to have an automated on-site testing of their potable water cycle for their mining community and their, uh, their, from their treatment facilities. So they've gained complete control of their testing. They've eliminated their reliance on external labs. And those lab results could take up to two weeks. So the, what they also had is recently, they actually had challenges to find a lab that would test their water because the labs were so overwhelmed with doing additional COVID testing and challenges related to the pandemic that their ability to do their own testing uh, was a, a bit of a, a safety net for them as allowed them to do something that uh, was being denied by these third party labs. Here in Canada, um, the, the uh, it, it is a, a international embarrassment and it's shocking how poor our approach has been to the, uh, the, the quality of the water in our indigenous communities, in our First Nations. We're doing a, a small part uh, by having more than 50 remote indigenous communities uh, that we are using our solution for. It gives them the benefit of taking full control over their water testing. They're no longer sending samples to a lab hundreds if not a thousand kilometers away, and they get those uh, full control of the testing and they get results immediately rather than having to wait two weeks to get those results. Uh, this is a, a group that uh, we enjoy talking about as well, is uh, we have a partnership with the International Triathlon Union. So we do all of their water testing for all the events around the world. It started with the 2018 Commonwealth Games in Australia, and we are working with them for the, uh, fingers crossed, the 2021 Olympics. Uh, that'll be taking place of, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, they're doing rapid on-site testing for uh, the water for all their swimmers. And uh, what's interesting in this, and uh, uh, Brian has loaded up some pictures, I hope, in the next few slides, but uh, the, the trial testing for the Olympic trial testing, excuse me, that test work was actually done inside a hotel room because there uh, were challenges with getting uh, results uh, from the lab there as well. Uh, Sydney Water Australia. Uh, this is an example we really enjoy talking about. Sydney Water started out as use case number one, as they had bought several of the uh, Tecta solutions. Uh, they had installed about a dozen instruments into their lab operation, and they were taking over all of their uh, in environmental response samples. They were looking for improved turnaround and looking for more flexibility, more rapid results. What they've done is they've actually taken the next step and they're moving them outside of the labs themselves. Um, they're actually creating a fleet of mobile labs that will be fully accredited and they'll do their microbiological testing on the road. And that's uh, incredibly exciting. 
So we often talk about with these three use cases that uh, the tech, the technology, automated microbiology can really be used anywhere at any time by anyone. So we've got a few good examples uh, coming along here. So this actually is the, uh, the infamous hotel room in, uh, in Tokyo, Japan, where the uh, triathlon uh, Olympic trials uh, were taking place. And you, you, you may or not recall, it, it was a little bit of news at the time, but these Olympic trials, actually the triathlon turned into a biathlon because the water, the swimming portion was actually canceled. And the swimming portion was canceled as a direct result of the tech, the technology telling them that they'd had a break in their wa in water nets that they used to protect the swimmers and the E. coli levels had jumped uh, extremely high. And if they had waited for the lab results to come back, the swimmers would already have swum. The swimmers would have become uh, ill as a result of the high uh, fecal count that was in the water. So they were very grateful that the E. coli te the te the technology was there to, uh, to protect the swimmers. Uh, this is the setup at uh, Las Vegas Valley, and uh, you may say that this is the, uh, the cleanest looking lab you've ever seen. That's because the only thing in this lab is the, tech, the technology. All of the other requirements, the accoutrements, everything else that's required for running microbiology is not in this lab because it's not necessary. So it's a very clean, very simple setup. Uh, this is an installation in Australia, uh, a unit that's actually within the water treatment, cell, treatment plant itself outside of the lab. And this is actually, this one makes me smile. This is a beach kiosk. And this, uh, as long as you have some power, uh, you have the ability to run microbiology. So these are actually lifeguards on the beach that would be uh, taking their samples uh, every morning and uh, having the results a few hours later. And then this one was exciting. This was a, uh, a project that we worked with uh, in China. And this is actually a tech, and you may say, oh, this looks like a lab. Well, this is uh, actually not a lab. Uh, this is actually a converted part of the kitchen uh, on this uh, boat that's uh, currently uh, traveling on the Yanks River. So that was a very exciting uh, Yanks River monitoring project that uh, we were working with and the tech system operating outside of the lab on the boat. PUB Singapore, this is a quick shot of uh, one of their mobile labs and one of the technicians that's inside their mobile lab. I think we have to give credit to uh, PUB Singapore as uh, uh, we showed them earlier that uh, they also are using the tech to, within the lab, bringing automation, improving, uh, improving their uh, efficiency. But they were also the very first to uh, introduce the, uh, the tech to a mobile lab. So while Sydney Water, I think, has the largest fleet, uh, all credit to PUB Singapore as they were first in uh, taking the technology on the road. This is actually a shot of uh, one of Sydney Water systems. And uh, as you can see, uh, their approach is uh, a little bit different from PUB Singapore's, but they will have a fleet of a dozen of these trucks that are driving around the greater Sydney area able to do microbiology on the spot. And this is a typical setup. And uh, uh, I guess you could uh, describe this as kind of a, uh, an engineering lab environment, but again, this is not a full microbiological lab, but it's just showing you the, uh, the range of, uh, of solutions that the, uh, the TECTA system can run in under such a different range of applications. So, so what we've tried to show you with uh, the, the three use cases we described uh, being used within a lab, bringing automation efficiencies and lowering costs, extending the capacity of a lab to uh, another location, but having that data all linked back to the lab. And then the third use case is actually replacing the lab and have the ability to do fully lab equivalent uh, microbiological testing on a remote site be it a boat, be it an indigenous community, being a mining camp in Mauritania. So let's talk very briefly about uh, how does this all coincide with the, uh, the, the monitoring of COVID-19 and, and what exactly are the various communities doing here? You know, Brian mentioned at the beginning that the additional COVID monitoring is putting additional uh, challenges to the labs and additional capacity uh, problems for them. So let's describe this a little bit. So in this slide here, we're talking about the fact that um, wastewater can actually be used by groups that are concerned about the routine monitoring of, uh, of communities. So how can we make sure that we aren't missing COVID testing that's taking place in the community? Because we now understand that a lot of COVID folks can be positive, but they can be asymptomatic or they don't have the time or they don't have the ability to, to get themselves to a central testing station. So what folks have learned is that ability to monitor a large number of people by what we call the sewer shed surveillance. And you can have as granular a system as you wish 
by you can have testing that's taking place on individual buildings or you can have broader level community testing that can be taking place. But by monitoring for COVID, you can get an indication or advance warning of a COVID outbreak because you will see it in the sewage water before necessarily you'll get a spike from your testing sites. So in this slide, what we have to realize is that the, the wastewater has a lot of inputs beyond just people and what's, what's coming out of the toilet, so to speak. There's washing machines, there's other flushing, there's uh, uh, storm water. All of these things are diluting and are changing the levels of the, COVID that's in, of the COVID bacteria that's in there. So what we've done then and utilizing the, tech, the technology is we've wanted to have a baseline to understand is the E. coli load changing? Because you could have a massive drop in the COVID uh, levels that are in wastewater, but that drop in COVID levels may have been the result of stormwater that's in the sewage system. So by having the equivalent E. coli measurement along with the COVID measurement, then you can have an understanding, is the COVID truly growing in the community? Is it staying stable or is it in fact dropping? So really, here's an example of how the wastewater surveillance approach could work in the sewer sedge and how the TECTA can fit into that testing regime. And basically in stage one is when the virus is excreted. Uh, and two, it's combined from all the residences, the hospitals, industrial users, and that sort of thing. And off it goes off to the uh, wastewater treatment plant. At this point, samples can be taken to test for uh, fecal coliform E. coli. At the same time, tests can be taken by uh, a rapid uh, qPCR method to be testing directly for the COVID. And in this way, you can have not just an estimate of the level of the COVID in your community. And as I said, the amount of samples can increase the granularity. So if you wanna have it on a very specific portion of the community, or if you wanna have it on a broader community base, it just depends on the quantities of samples that you take and where you take them. And then the TECTA here is playing an important role as establishing that E. coli baseline. And by comparing the uh, COVID uh, uh, level with the uh, E. coli baseline, you can have a true understanding as the COVID levels are growing and the speed at which they're growing. Thank you so very much for uh, taking a little bit of time to talk about automated methods and how they're applying and improving things in, uh, in lab operations and, uh, and, and reducing the burden uh, of those labs and introducing the ability of lab equivalent uh, automation into a lot of more remote uh, situations. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Doug, and uh, excellent analysis. I've got uh, questions. Uh, most have come through either on WhatsApp. A few of you have also sent emails on the more detailed questions. If I may, I'll take uh, perhaps the first two questions uh, and do a round of either two or three, depending on the length of the question. Um, the first question uh, goes to you, Brian. C coming at the earlier stages of your introduction, you've obviously been at the helm of Canada Africa Trade and Investment for a long time. What specific to the African continent did you see as an advantage in you know, bringing on board um, the particular solutions that Doug and his firm have outlined in comparison to some of the other key players out there? Just going to that question of compatibility with the African context. And then uh, I do want to acknowledge the ambassador of Zimbabwe who's joined us, uh, Honorable Ruth Chakwira, welcome. Um, I did smile at some of the points you raised, Doug, around testing. The Minister of Sports in Zimbabwe is, in fact, a world record uh, swimming champion and has been leading the charge there around uh, sports in, in the country. A question to you, Doug, is, is as follows around local empowerment. Um, for many, the application of new technologies in Africa is in a broader context of empowering and training those there to take control and to execute. Um, some examples, perhaps, from Canada, such as the First Nations communities or any others, including Mauritania, um, would be welcome. That kind of goes to that, that broader perspective. I think I'll leave it at those two questions and come back for the next round. And again, I see the Q&A chat is starting to fill. Feel free to use that email or WhatsApp. I don't mind. I've got my finger on all of them. Over to you, Brian. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, what, um, how we started off uh, the relationship with TECTA is that uh, we had been hosting um, a lot of uh, delegations uh, in Kingston specifically. So we've uh, hosted uh, the entire SADC delegation, uh, uh, SADC uh, representatives to Canada in Kingston many times. And we've taken them to look at all the various technologies that are out there. And 
with an eye on making sure that what we're bringing back into the continent is not stuff that's already being developed on the continent. Because I think Africa has a lot of capacity and there are technologies, um, PESA being one of those technologies that where we've actually far ahead of the rest of the world in terms of uh, getting technology that can actually impact everyone else. But on this issue of microbiome and the issues that had been coming up, uh, cholera, typhoid, you see it in the news a lot. Uh, I felt that the technology that was being used uh, elsewhere in the world and the fact that uh, um, Tecta had a disruptive technology that could really change and impact positively what was going on on the continent. We felt that this would be a very good technology to take to the continent and uh, try to get it out there. So what that really means is that, um, like Doug said, it's um, been 30 years uh, without any real development within that sector. Uh, and uh, like we did with uh, telephones and so forth, we actually leapfrogged everybody else in terms of use, which is why on the continent, we're actually fired in terms of mobile technology. This technology that Tecta is using is very similar to that, is that it's, uh, it's so far ahead of its time that uh, and the other parts of the world already have some of the infrastructure that's harder to replace. In our situation, we have some places where there's limited infrastructure and this system can actually alleviate some of the challenges we're having, uh, like you're seeing in the First Nations community. So, so I, I felt this was uh, a technology worth bringing to the continent. Good. Uh, and Doug, the question of uh, local capacity training for deployment of the technology, thank you. And that's a, a, an incredibly important question because uh, part of the struggle here in Canada with the Indigenous communities has been um, the, these, these white elephant installations that are done and millions of dollars are spent on a new water treatment system and it's dropped in place by an engineering company from, uh, from outside the community. It's, it's put in place, it's set up and then they disappear. And all of a sudden the community is left trying to, trying to work with us. And initial training may have been done all in good faith and, 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 and well done, but that capacity, uh, that capacity may, may slowly disappear, uh, maintenance challenges. So what we had to understand a little bit is it's not just dropping in new technology, but it's also understanding a little bit of, of the culture that's taking place there as well. And there may be one person that's responsible for the water treatment facility, that's also responsible for the testing, uh, that's also responsible for, uh, for other things outside of the community that may take them outside the community for a month at a time. So this technology is very helpful in that regard because it requires very little in the way of setup. Uh, the training is very, very simple to do. It can be done to, uh, with multiple people so that there's, there's backups available. And uh, depending on the, the province in Canada, uh, some of them have, a, have, a, have a, a system in which we will do a train the trainer program and then that person will be responsible for going to the, uh, the individual communities. But we're working with over 50 communities. And I have to say our individual technicians have been to a number of these communities that there are no roads, unless you count the ice roads, uh, but they have to get there uh, by plane. And it's only, they're only available to get there certain months of the year. So the fact that the technology is very simple to use, it does not require a great deal of upkeep or maintenance. And uh, the training can be very simple and uh, it becomes a very good uh, technology because it is so simple to use for those very remote communities because there's, uh, we're always available for support, but it's, it's not a very, um, I would need to be careful. The engineers would be upset. I was gonna say it's not a complicated technology, but there's not a lot of it that can, that can go wrong once it's set up, it's, uh, it, it continues to work. Well, and, and I think I think to add to that, um, the technology itself doesn't need a microbiologist to run. Uh, and that's that's the, the, key, the key point is that, the technology, the science uh, is all in the technology. And so you don't really need uh, an actual microbiologist to run the technology. You can, once you train people, and these can be people with uh, just um, a good high school education, some basic understanding of science can be trained within a couple of hours to actually start running the test, uh, which is quite uh, revolutionary. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, Doug. Uh, your Excellency Abu Salih, Ambassador of Sudan, thank you so much for your question uh, around how we utilize technology to help manage and uh, monitor water quality. Specifically, your question refers to the application of the technology in rural areas of Sudan. 
And uh, you also mentioned the role of the UN as a multilateral body. A question, if I may add to you, Doug, is do you work in addition to directly with local authorities through multilateral institutions or development partners as well? Um, we certainly have a number of those here in Canada. Uh, and then the second question, I'll refer to uh, Shivam Shah, who asks the question around data. Uh, is this data, data in a friendly way pulled into a central backend database um, in order to have a constant sharing with different locations uh, for real-time analytics? Uh, I'll come back to questions uh, that are also on the chat after these first two. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much for those. Those are, are both very important questions. I appreciate those. Um, with respect to, uh, and you know what, I may, uh, I may tackle the second question first, if you don't mind. With respect to the, um, the data, the, the intent of the system is that all the data is located within, within the system itself. So you've got those uh, local reports and uh, all of that's available on the equipment itself. It can also be downloaded on, on a USB stick if you wish to take that off. But more importantly, the entire system is, ne is networkable. So it can be sent off to a central database. We have not created that central database. We have found that our customers want the data to be incorporated within their database that already exists. And that may be a lab information system uh, that uh, they already have in place. It may be a, something as simple as a, as a larger spreadsheet. But uh, we do not create that database itself, but we do work with uh, our customers to make sure that there's, uh, there's capability and uh, the data format that's leaving our system is compatible with the, uh, with the database that they have. Uh, with respect to these, uh, these multilateral organizations, uh, we have had a, a number of, of conversations. We don't have uh, active partnerships as of yet, but we would very much uh, like to do so. Uh, we did participate uh, recently. The UN has been doing an evaluation of rapid uh, microbiological methods uh, that are available in the market, and we're participating in that process as it's ongoing. Um, the Belinda, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has expressed interest as well, but uh, nothing that uh, has uh, reached that state where uh, it's been formal, but we'd be very interested in, in working with those types of organizations to bring this technology to remote locations. Um, just to add to that as well, on the continent, uh, we, we've been having conversations with uh, similar such organizations, and we've come up with a plan that would allow us to be able to work more effectively with those agencies if they do come forward. Uh, we're already exploring some ideas. We're actually exploring some ideas for Zimbabwe that are along those lines of bringing multiple partners uh, to the table just to try and achieve that. Um, on the database, we've also been receiving a lot of questions about how do we manage a database and what about for those organizations that don't have a database in place. What we're actually doing on the continent is we're actually setting up a portal where you can actually go and see your, your, your data and your results that's secure for, for your particular organization. So those are all things that are sort of uh, on the go as we, as we speak. Brilliant. Uh Tanda Buchle Gonose has asked the question around COVID restrictions and supplies. Um, how have you been able to uh, get supplies through to people on the ground? In some countries, there has been a struggle to procure, and uh, not just procure, but get delivery. How have you mitigated against that in places like Mauritania? And then, Brian, if I could allude to your question, uh, you mentioned Zimbabwe in particular. Her Excellency Chikwira, the ambassador, has just asked around uh, addressing the question of funding and perhaps are there sort of funding sources uh, in addition to working with development agencies, mechanisms or other sources of finance uh, where you can help finance the delivery of these sorts of options? Any, any thoughts on that would be welcomed as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, Tandu. Um, we, we know Tandu Bushe quite well. Um, so um, I think the one advantage of the TECTA, unlike other systems, is that uh, once the system is in place, in fact, most places where we send systems, we have systems uh, in Kenya, we have systems in South Africa, um, and uh, as you noticed in Mauritania. And what typically happens is the tech, uh, some cartridges are just sent by FedEx or DHL. So some, it takes maximum three to four days. We've had situations uh, in Kenya where we've had some delays and some of those were mostly due to some of the requirements uh, for the system in that the system, when you send something new into Kenya, and I, I know a few countries in Africa do the same, they require that the systems be have an SGS certification 
uh, that shows that it's compliant with the rules that are local. And those agencies sometimes will cause some of the delays that you see. But in places where there are no rest such restrictions, South Africa is one. Uh, we've we had quite a bit of success where we send uh, products and they're there within three to four days. Um, so, so that uh, issue is one that can, I mean, we're quite here because our products are light. Um, and most of what we do is ship by air. So it's gonna be quite fast getting products there. Um, the question of financing, I mean, we've been receiving a lot of questions as well with that regard. And one of the challenges that we've been noticing organizations having is that the biggest challenge they have is the actual money to for capital expenditure has been quite limited in a lot of those organizations. So we've come up with a system that allows us to provide the systems and uh, then people pay per test. Uh, and that has been quite successful in that uh, organizations don't have to be concerned as much about the capital expenditure. They just have to be concerned uh, on the actual products that they're buying um, or the service that they're buying. And that system has been working quite well. Fantastic. Uh, Doug, would you like to add anything or you covered? I think the, uh, the, the, the supply chain challenges, I was just talking to uh, one of our suppliers yesterday and uh, he does a lot of work in the automotive industry as well. And the supply chain challenges are, are truly global. And uh, our, we find our most effective way to deal with the, the normal supply chain logistics as well as the additional challenges from the pandemic is to work with uh, local partners uh, that know the environment, that know the individual challenges, that have additional feet on the ground and really can extend our capacity. And you know, partners such as uh, Brian at Map Africa has that knowledge uh, of the continent, has the additional resources on the ground and is able to facilitate those things that we certainly, we simply couldn't do ourselves. So having very high quality local partnerships, that is the way that we've been uh, mitigating the challenges of, of the supply chain has been working very well. Fantastic. Well, as, as many know, the Canada-Africa Chamber of Business was honoured to host Prime Minister Justin Trudeau at a luncheon at the African Union early last year. And one of the themes that the Prime Minister and the Government of Canada has often spoken about is the blue, blue economy, which encompasses clean water and access. Uh, a wonderful question from the Honourable Yasmin Ratanzi, a Member of Parliament, uh, very prominent in the government. Uh, wonderful to have you here, MP. The, the issue is around technology, and the question is, technology is important, but it needs people to manage it. How are you training people on this system of water purification? And secondly, are you working with engineers without borders to help with the installation systems and to provide technological support? Uh, a second question from Michael Onyango, how do you ensure that only those authorized to supply the equipments are the ones who actually do so? Uh, over to you. Um, okay, I, I think uh, I'll take uh, on uh, Michael's uh, question, I guess, and I'll leave the, one, the other question for, for Doug, uh, but I'll try to attempt to answer that as well. Um, so with, um, with, we have had, uh, I mean, some challenges in some uh, uh, parts of the continent where we sort of spend quite a bit of time identifying the ideal partners. And there's been situations where we've had uh, partners that were not as ideal uh, and uh, that we see as we've been learning as we go. However, um, most of the places uh, that we have partners, the partners that we have are really, really quite uh, effective. So in South Africa, we have um, a sub distributor. We have sub distributors in Kenya as well. Uh, most of the other places we distribute directly. Uh, and so from that standpoint, having those people on the ground and those sub distributors are the ones who are authorized to do the distribution. They also are trained to also do the training and the support and so forth. Uh, so in those kind of situations, we don't need um, uh, say engineers without borders to help, uh, but we are open to collaborating with other organizations that may want. So say if engineers without borders are setting up a water treatment system and they want uh, the monitoring to be part of that solution, we would train them so they can train uh, whoever the end users are. Uh, over to you, Doug. Sure, I, I can add to that. The, uh, it, it's fortunate that we're, uh, we are not so massive that uh, we, we, we know our customers tremendously well. And we have had situations where we've been contacted and we've refused sales because it's uh, uh, entities that uh, we don't know 
and we're not familiar with. And once we build a relationship and we understand what the application is and who their potential customers are, then we'll move forward with them in, in some sort of a partnership for introducing to a new, a new country or things like that. But we're, we're very careful to, uh, to make sure that we're not just, we don't sell blindly on the internet, I guess is what the, the simplest answer in that regard. Thank you very much. Uh, two two follow-up questions. Uh, the first from MP Ratanzi, the second from Mr. Onyango. Uh, the Honourable Member notes that there is another issue of concern, which is with nomadic groupings. They rely on their cattle uh, and they need access to clean water. There have been numerous instances of the pollution of water through animal feces. How will the technology help with mitigating this particular situation? And then uh, the follow-up question from Michael Onyango is how can you ensure that the cost remains low compared to other available technologies? And how do you dispose of the cartridges at the end? Um, okay, I think I'll attempt to answer, um, in fact, all of, all of the questions. Um, and uh, Doug can probably help with the one on uh, disposing of cartridges. Uh, but with regards to places where we're working, um, and Zimbabwe is an example, we're talking right now with uh, the Environmental Management Agency in, in, in Zimbabwe. And one of the challenges they have is what has been uh, described by um, uh, 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 Yasmin. And one of, one, of those, one of those challenges is that some places are quite remote and uh, having access to labs for those communities has become quite challenging. And so that's where you have the issues where water is not tested adequately in those areas or monitored. And so you have those issues. So in a scenario that has been described for nomadic tribes, uh, I think if there was a tector close to any of those areas, it means those nomadic tribes can actually help by collecting water samples, bringing them to a location that's close to where they are and test a run. And so you can have, once you have a proper monitoring system set up in place, uh, that can be done quite effectively. Uh, and currently there's nothing available where you can do it uh, on a regular basis except the detector. And so we're hoping to help actually communities like this to set up some kind of system where the monitoring is done on a regular basis to avoid such challenges. Uh, and with regards to pricing and cost, I mean, our technology, the price is the same everywhere it's sold uh, and uh, it stays that way. But when you compare to something like the Collilet, there's always a comparison of the cost of the actual test, which may seem a little bit higher on the texture than the, the Collilet. But when you see the example that was given of the conventional method versus the new method, there's a lot of uh, staff time required to run a collulate. There's a lot of time required to actually analyze and assess the results, which a lot of organizations don't take into consideration all those costs. Uh, whereas our cost uh, for running the test, uh, so an example is that you can run a TECTA test, uh, like preparing it in two minutes to five minutes. That, and then after that, the system is automated and it sends the results automatic, automatically. In all the other examples, it doesn't work that way. You have, somebody has to sit there and analyze the results. So those main hours, then there's the cost of transportation and um, the cost of incubating the results in a separate uh, piece of equipment. And then all those pieces of equipment have to be purchased separately. So when you take all of those and you put them together, uh, TECTA is the most cost effective system there is at the moment. Uh, and then when you look at the cost of time, the difference between a result in um, 12 to 18 hours uh, versus a result in 48 to 72 hours, the difference uh, could mean life and death for most. And within the TECTA, if the results are highly contaminated, you know your results in two hours, which is why uh, the um, a triathlon uh, organization is using the TICTA because it's the only system that can give them results as early as they need in order to run competitions. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Oh, sorry, Jago. No, that's, that's absolutely, that's fine. Uh, and uh, no, I will, uh, I, I will let, let Brian answer first because he's got such the, the intimate knowledge of the, of the continent. And uh, he's actually bringing some very interesting uh, programs that are specific to the continent only. That uh, we're, we're fascinated to see uh, how they uh, how, how they flesh out and get accomplished. 
but uh, we're, we're, we're fascinated by, uh, uh, he's not just bringing technology, but he's bringing economic development to the continent as well. And uh, we're, we're, we're very supportive of that work, very interesting. Um, with respect to the question on, on disposal, yes, there, there is the requirement to, uh, to dispose of that cartridge. Uh, we can say there is um, the cartridge is the only thing that needs to be disposed of from uh, from our system versus the uh, multiple cartridges and, and various other things from uh, other methods. But yes, it, it is uh, fully re recyclable uh, as uh, is a, a standard polypropylene uh, material, but it, it does need to be disposed of in, in some way based on the local standards. Excellent. Uh, the next question is first of a, a comment that simply is congratulations uh, on this technology. Are you able to share any insights into uh, technology you're working on or anticipate may emerge in the next five to 10 years, uh, given that uh, there hasn't been a lot of innovation um, until, of course, what we've seen presented today? So any insights on that, no pressure that you can share, um, I think would be, would be helpful. And then from the perspective of your company, uh, you've alluded to different ways of working with both governments, multilateral agencies, um, as well as uh, uh, local governments. But do you, do you have an ideal model with which you in, like to engage? Uh, and this goes to the question of PPEs. Is there a certain structure that is optimal for you for a region or an authority uh, to begin working with your firm? Well, I mean, we've, we've looked at uh, each different situation has been, uh, we've been learning along the way. Uh, when we started, we were trying as much as possible to sell a complete system. So the actual uh, systems that, are, that need to be used, so the instruments as well as the cartridges and then train people and teach people on how to use it. But we found that uh, that solution was limiting in that most organizations that uh, need the services. So uh, like Yasmin suggested uh, with um, the communities that are quite remote in remote areas. If you are running based on a strategy where you people buy an instrument and then they buy the cartridges, uh, the budget for putting the capital expense will be quite limited. So they end up going, okay, we need 20 systems, but our budget only allows one. So they buy one system and then you're back to the same solution, the challenge that we we're having earlier. So what we found uh, to be an effective solution is one way we identify the demand. So we identify or rather not the demand as such, but the need. So if the need is to have uh, all these nomadic communities having the water wells tested on a weekly basis uh, to make sure that everything uh, is clean and so forth, we identify that challenge and then we say, okay, where is the greatest need? And we put a machine there. So if the need is for two machines, we put two machines. Uh, and then, uh, so it's all based on the amount of tests that need to be run. And since the cost is going to be the, the cost of the test, it becomes less expensive. And when you look at the alternatives, it actually becomes quite uh, reasonably priced. So in some situations where we've done that kind of assessment, we found that we reduced the cost by almost half of doing that. Uh, and so that has been the most effective. And so we, we're looking, we're exploring, so in Zimbabwe we're exploring a partnership with the Environmental Management Agency to collaborate on a structure exactly like that. In other places, we have uh, sub-distributors that resell and those sub-distributors. So in Kenya, for example, our sub-distributors will use the same model where you buy the equipment um, or you, you, uh, you, they list the equipment to you and you, uh, you, buy, you pay for the test as you go. And then over time, the equipment is paid off. So there's many models and each model is structured based on the need and what the partners want. And there's some partners that say, you know what, we want the equipment, we want training and uh, we want you guys to step away. So it all depends on how much hands on uh, support the organizations need. And that's what we provide. Excellent. Uh, next question somewhat goes to the, the earlier question around technology. Eduardo Bailetti is asking the question around the next three years. What, in your view, does Tector PDS look like in terms of your presence on the continent, that aspiration? And here a question for our private sector members. Where do you need specific areas of help? Uh, are there areas of possible business development or other implementation uh, partnership? Are those opportunities at the moment for the company? 
Um, well, I, I'll answer on behalf of MAP and I'm sure Doug will answer on behalf of Tecta in terms of uh, what support they need. Um, we, there are things that we, I mean, there's a lot of microbiological tests that are run on the continent that I would love from my perspective to see more of that done. And I know Tecta are working on some of those ideas and some of those uh, tests to make sure that the Tecta can deliver such tests uh, in future. Um, in terms of um, where I see uh, the system working on the continent, I, I hope that we get to a point where we have no issues of cholera or typhoid. Uh, and some of that is um, by constant monitoring. So they require, the United Nations requires that um, governments run uh, a certain number of tests per population. I think it's uh, uh, 120 tests for every 10,000 or something like that uh, of the population. In Africa, we're falling far behind on that. Uh, in, the, in Canada, the US, they run 10 times those tests that are required by the United Nations, sometimes 20 times that. Uh, so I, I would love to see a scenario where um, tests are run adequately and people can rely on those tests and ensure that the test water is being monitored where, what, where there's contamination, people can avoid those points uh, well in advance so that those issues can go down. So that's what I foresee happening and I'd love to see that happening uh, continent wide. Excellent. Uh, Doug, you had an yeah, addition. Adding on to Brian's comments, uh, it, it absolutely is, is wanting to see an increased focus on the monitoring of water. And, and I think someone mentioned in their comments that uh, water is life. Um, uh, this company was founded actually, and for, for folks that are, are on the continent, they may not be aware, but Canada had a, uh, what we call the, refer to as the Walkerton E. coli disaster took place in the year 2000. But uh, what was shocking for us as Canadians, and uh, I, I think sometimes we, we get a little, we, we take these things for granted because we are so blessed with, uh, with water. But there is a small town of about 5,000 people just uh, less than an hour outside of Toronto. And uh, nine people died as a result of E. coli poisoning. Now it was a perfect storm and there was people that were incompetent and all sorts of things. But the very idea that people could die from fecal contamination here in Canada, and that's what launched this company. And our goal really was to prevent such a disaster ever taking place again. And realizing as this company developed that because uh, we were so blessed here, there was many countries that had challenges. And the, 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 the thing is, as an engineer that we, uh, we, we challenge with waters, it's not just that if water doesn't disappear. Uh, water is either in the wrong place or water has been contaminated so it can't be used as it is. So that is the goal of the technology is to improve the, uh, the, the knowledge of the water, because if you're not measuring it, then you can't treat it. And uh, you, if you don't have that knowledge then you don't know what to do with the water to make it safe for everyone. But really our primary goal, and, and we often call it as a, a calling is, is to uh, raise the profile of, uh, of, of water monitoring because uh, the, the illness that's related to contaminated water is staggering across the globe and to make the improvements. With respect to uh, what does Tecta PDS need and what does Map Africa need? Um, it really, it's a, we're, a, we're a, a relatively a small organization, even though we're, we're selling in over 40 countries, it's just raising the profile. Uh, as uh, we've said, the technology really hasn't changed that much in the last 30 or 40 years. What used to be good enough is no longer good enough. As technology makes these dramatic improvements and that technology will save lives, it really needs to be adapted as, as the next level of standard. And uh, that's really our goal, is to make TACTA the next level of standard that's, uh, that's being used around the globe. Fantastic. Uh, we've got just uh, around two minutes to go. Uh, a question from South Africa, uh, from one of the authorities there, Gerald Smith. Uh, notes that you've got clients in South Africa or there are clients in South Africa who are sometimes skeptical when it comes to giving SUD distributors and the necessary technical support. Uh, he asks, can you put them at ease and reaffirm your support in this regard? Um, and that's Gerald from Infuleni Water Solutions in South Africa. Um, any, any comment to that, just to again, ease that concern sometimes from potential buyers? Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. I, I think we, we've been working uh, with Tecta to see, uh, what we have um, is that um, as we get more systems on the ground and we train more people to use those systems, uh, we're gonna st start to see that some of those technical supports that are required uh, 
getting on the ground. So we're going to be having more trained people within South Africa to help with that and support uh, companies like m uh, with uh, some of the challenges they may uh, foresee. Uh, we're doing it uh, in Kenya as well, where we have uh, sub-distributors is helping them to have the capacity. And uh, that capacity will come also as we get more clients and we see the challenges that are coming back. But what we've also found is that um, the challenges that uh, we may have in North America are completely different from the challenges that we may have on the continent. And so we've been trying to learn as we go and figure out what is the best way to get that uh, in place. One of the things we're going to be doing is have our sub distributors actually come to Canada for advanced training so that they get to understand a little bit more. And as uh, things open up and travel opens up, we're going to be having our teams here in Canada go to anywhere where we have uh, enough clients, well, where we have clients and actually train them and also look at their situation and look at where we need to change or where we need to advance, where we need to be better at doing things. Uh, but it's uh, it's been a learning process and we're enjoying the ride. And I think we're just going to improve as we come up across some challenges, we we'll improve so that we're better at addressing those. Brilliant. And uh, we have reached the end of the program. And I'd like to invite before closing each of you to offer some closing comments. And if I can add a question and you can speak to that in your in your comments, it's around any challenges that you're experiencing in, in these 40 countries or other potential markets around the regulatory environment. We do have a lot of uh, policymakers from both sides of the Atlantic uh, on this call, but on other calls as well. Any particular issues from a legislative or regulatory perspective uh, that you sometimes run into, which could be reformed uh, to enable greater adoption and availability of this technological solution. Um, and of course, we'll put you in touch with any particular embassy or high commission you'd like to engage with directly. But uh, if you'd like to speak to that in your concluding remarks, feel free. Uh, but otherwise, the floor is yours to, to take us away for the end of a great webinar. Uh, Doug, do you want to go first, I guess? Sure, yeah, I'll take us. Uh, so uh, um, thank you, Gareth, once again for this uh, for this opportunity. And uh, it really is our pleasure to be working with uh, a partner such as uh, Map Africa that's uh, taking this technology. Um, uh, moving into uh, into the continent was uh, was a real challenge that we were looking at. So having a, a partner like Map Africa that uh, is able to take on the uh, that role was uh, was fantastic for us. Um, it really has been. Uh, um, fascinating in the, in the water industry and seeing the different challenges from around the world. And what we see in the continent is similar to some of the things that uh, we saw in some countries in Asia, is the continent really has the ability and the opportunity to leapfrog, you know, current technologies that in Canada that uh, we assume, well, these are the technologies that we've been using for the last 20 or 30 years. And the continent can leapfrog those technologies completely and move into uh, new opportunities uh, newer technologies that can really take them to the new level, and we'd like to play a very small role in that. Um, to your uh, to your uh, your question on on regulatory standards, uh, we, we do find that uh, regulators have an incredibly important role in making sure that products are safe and making sure that technology is safe and being utilized. But yes, there's a balance there as well for making sure that uh, the technology, uh, when it is safe, is uh, getting out to the end users. And I think the uh, the approval process for vaccines in such a record time for COVID is is a good example of that. So we very much uh, uh, like to work with uh, regulators, and I. Again, we have found that uh, regulators, uh, I'll use Asian as an as example, as, as being some similarities to the continent, um, being much more flexible and having a much more practical uh, approach, uh, whereas the regulators sometimes in North America and Europe uh, sometimes are a little too bureaucratic and uh, they're, they're more interested in saying no because no is always a safe answer. So uh, the, the, the practical regulators, uh, we very much enjoy working with and uh, we've had very good results with those folks that uh, we've brought the technology to. But again, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on this. Yeah, well, for, I mean, for us, uh, it's, been, it's been an interesting uh, process, a, a good learning process. So in um, most places where we've been, we've tried to sort of have a good relationship with the regulators. So in South Africa, in partnership with our local partners, uh, uh, actually m uh, we've we approached the um, regulators first uh, and we showed them the system, we showed them how it works. 
uh, they've uh, been open to really supporting it, uh, including giving us letters of support uh, that uh, this actually is a system that works. Uh, but it's also, we've had the advantage in that uh, the system is um, AOAC approved. Uh, and so most of the organizations on the ground, uh, the standards associations and so forth within the continent um, trust the AOAC and uh, because of that, they, they really have been supportive. The challenge that we've been seeing is just really getting people to move past what they're used to using to changing to something more modern. And that has been difficult. Uh, it hasn't been as difficult from the labs. So the lab, um, the labs themselves have been actually at the forefront of wanting detectors. So most of the lab people on the continent know or heard about uh, detector. And so we've been getting a lot of uh, questions. So for example, uh, Tando, who asked the question earlier, she actually approached us without actually any knowledge of her and their needs on the continent. And they already knew of the system. So that uh, is helpful. But what we've been finding is once it goes past the lab and it goes to the upper management and so forth, everything has been stored at that level. And that has been the biggest challenge we've been having. And then the other challenge we've been noticing, uh, particularly in Kenya, is that there's um, a huge delay that's caused by uh, the SGS certification, which we believe is necessary. Uh, but in some cases, it's causing delays of a month to two months uh, between when we are supposed to ship and when the product is delivered because that process takes long. Uh, and so, so some of those have been, have been challenges, but on both sides of the continent, people have been trying to be as extremely supportive and give us an opportunity to work with them. So we hope to get over most of these issues as we go forward. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the uh, your fellow board members, Mr. Brian Dodo, and certainly all members to you as well, Doug, thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, enormous words of congrats and compliments, as mentioned, that have come through. Uh, and the spirit with which you drive these solutions in real Canada-Africa partnership is deeply appreciated. Thank you to all the members, the businesses, the decision makers in public policy, governments who've been with us, as well as academia. Uh, we had 88 delegates, not all could make it, but the recording will be available for each and every one, as well as for distribution and, and sharing with your networks and your respective agencies and authorities on the ground in the African continent. Uh, it's my pleasure to sign off and once again, to give my sincerest thanks to a long standing sponsor and supporter, Map Africa, uh, and all the great work that you've done in particular, Brian Dodo and Doug Wilton for your commitment and your passion and the innovation. Have a wonderful rest of the evening for all across the African continent and uh, a very good afternoon to everyone here in Canada. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Details will follow and are available on the website. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.